All right, today we're going to review for your test tomorrow on the federal bureaucracy. We don't have to review? No. Today, or tomorrow, your test will be over the federal bureaucracy <laughs> as well as checks and balances, so make sure that you're aware of that. Federal. Actually, your FRQ, your response portion for this particular test was your homework. If you haven't done it, then I'm not going to count off points for you not doing it already, but if you've turned it in, I'll give you an extra 100 on a quiz grade for what? you have turned it in. Sorry? The homework that was due today. All right, we're going to review. The paper is for you to take notes on, things that you need to write down for your, for your tests. All right. Federal bureaucracy is a part of which branch of government? Exactly. It's an executive branch who leads it, who's supposed to lead it. President, President. President of the United States, what do they do? What's their job? They execute, well. they execute policy. Which policies? Policies coming from who? Congress. 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 Laws coming from Congress. What else? Decisions made by federal government. Decisions made by who? Federal government. Uh, by the courts? By the judges and justices of the federal courts? And actions made by who? President, President of the United States. Including what? Executive orders, yes ma'am. Um, if, um, if a bill is passed, it's a law, right? Yes. Okay, and the law is given to the bureaucracy to execute? To execute and implement, so the, yes. So does that mean the president already accepted it? So when it becomes the president? Kind of, but most of the work is done by Congress, right? They're the ones that wrote it, and they're the ones that um, amended it. All the president does is sign it into law or fail it, or reject it, or vote, or veto it. All right, um, is everybody good with that? Your federal bureaucracy is made of three categories. The top level, the 15 top level, are called cabinet what? Department. Departments, and they're led by? Secretary. They're led by secretaries, like the Department of State is led by the Secretary of State. So that's the first category. Um, they're in charge of their own policy area. There are usually um, thousands of people inside each department, or hundreds of people inside each department, and they spend millions of dollars in each one of these departments. And then the next category are commissions and agencies, like the EPA, whenever there's an agency at the end or a commission at the end, that's what we're talking about here. NASA would be an agency. They're in charge of their specific policy area, like NASA is in charge of space exploration, EPA is in charge of regulating environment. What's the last one called? You got departments, agencies and commissions. Last one is? USPS is a what? Oh, oh. It's a private, private company. It's not private, it's public, but it's like a private company. They're called government corporations. Government corporations. They function like a private company, but they're not private companies or public companies. We own them, basically. These are companies that the government runs, and the public, we own them. And they provide services like mail, like transportation, like the Amtrak does with trains. So these are government corporations. You've got three categories. Second one are agencies and commissions. Those are the most common ones. There's hundreds of those. All right. So, so oh, a lot of people on your homework, you guys get confused about this? I've been noticing. Civil services. What do we call people that work for the federal bureaucracy? Bureaucrats. Bureaucrats or civil servants. Those are the people that work for the federal bureaucracy. Um, a long time ago, before the Pendleton Civil Service Act, which most of, which all of you in this class should know because it's part of your EOC, before the Pendleton Civil, Ser Pendleton Civil Service Act, most of the jobs and most of the positions that are in government are what? Appointed, Appointed by who usually? The president. The president, especially the top level ones. What is the Pendleton Civil Service Act going to do? It's going to say that most of those appointments are now no longer going to be appointed by the president. He can only, that's, uh, the appointment power is going to be reserved for who? Heads. The heads of agencies and the heads of departments, but most of the jobs are going to be based on what now? Heads. Based on merit. It's going to be based on your ability, based on your talent. So, 1877 was when the Civil Service Act was, was passed. Before 1877, who had a lot of power on the federal bureaucracy? President. The president does. He still has a lot of power today, but he had a lot more power before 1877, before that Civil Service Act was passed. 
Because he can make appointments, and he can make those appointments based on what? Patronage. What does patronage mean? He awards government jobs to people who are what? People who are loyal to him, people who have contributed to his campaign when he was running for president. Patronage? I don't know. All right. Then we transition. After 1877, they passed the Pendleton Civil Service Act, and we get the civil service system. And instead of patronage now, it's about what? Merit. It's about merit. Most of those jobs are no longer appointed by the President of the United States. They are, they are hired and promoted based on merit, based on ability and talent, based on a test. So it doesn't necessarily appoint them. He doesn't appoint everybody anymore. Most of the bureaucrats are not appointed by him anymore. Only the top level jobs are appointed by him now. He still has some influence, he still has a lot of influence, but he doesn't have as much influence as he used to have. What else did the Pendleton Civil Service Act do? What else did the civil service system do? Besides making a lot of those jobs based on merit now, what else did it do? It made it harder to do what? It made it harder to fire bureaucrats, especially if you don't have a good reason to. Before, it, bureaucrats can be let go because of political reasons. If a Republican comes into power, they can just fire the Democrats. Nowadays, it's very difficult to fire bureaucrats now. Anybody have any questions? Oh, by the way, connect this with what you've learned so far. If you're a bureaucrat, you know, for the most part, if you don't mess up, um, your job is probably safe. Um, your boss can't really fire you for no good reason. They can't fire you for political reasons. You're protected by the civil service system. What would that allow you to do? Uh, not worry about it makes you independent, right? It makes you independent from the president. It makes you independent from a lot of people. So you're going to make decisions, right? It's going to allow you to make decisions based on who? You. Based on your expertise, based on your judgment. What do we call that? Oh, trust. That's discretionary authority. The Pendleton Civil Service Act, the civil service system, it also increases um, discretionary authority. Because our bureaucrats right now, they know for the most part their jobs are safe. And they can make decisions and apply the expertise and apply their judgment without worrying about politics, without worrying about what the president thinks of their decision, because for the most part, their jobs are safe. Whose job are not safe, though? The heads of agency. Those guys can get fired at the president's will. They're not protected by the civil service system. Anybody confused about the civil service system? What's the result of the civil service system? What happened to our federal bureaucracy? Um, got better. It got better. It got more effective because people are getting hired and promoted based on what? Their, their merit, their expertise. Uh, what happened, what else happened oh, to the federal bureaucracy? Sorry? Well, it's not all overpowered to them. Like, it limited whose power? President. The president's power. Because most of the jo those jobs are out of his control now. And those jobs are, are, are hired and promoted based on merit. And he can't just fire whoever he wants. What else? Did it do to our federal bureaucracy? Think. If jobs are not given based on politics and firings are not done based on politics anymore, what does that mean to the federal bureaucracy? It's not more expertise. It's not corrupt, it's, there's more expertise. They can make decisions that are not what? Influence. They're, they're not influenced by? It's not influenced by politics. It's more neutral now. They make decisions that are bipartisan. They implement policy um, according to what they feel is good. It's not necessarily what the Democrats feel is good or what the Republicans feel is good. It's, it's immune from politics, where most of them are immune from politics. Who's not immune from politics? The heads, the heads are still not immune, yes. They are being influenced by Congress because of iron triangles, right? But for the most part, Right? They can make decisions on their own. So if they say made everything less political. They made everything less political. That's the goal of the Pendant of Civil Service Act. Make things less political. Is anybody confused about the civil service system? How it limited the president's power? How it made the federal bureaucracy better? Pretty good. Do not say that on your test, don't put, the president can no longer appoint people to the federal bureaucracy. That's not the case. He can't appoint most of the jobs anymore, but the heads he still controls. 
I saw that on your homework a lot. What does the federal bureaucracy actually do? They implement policy, they make what? They make regulations, and what do they do with those regulations? They enforce those regulations. How? Tell me ways in which a federal bureaucracy can enforce regulations. Rules that they make. Let's say I'm the EPA. I made a regulation that you can't pollute this much in the air. What do I do to a corporation that breaks that regulation? I can find them. I can take them to court. There's many ways that I can, I can enforce that regulation. So a lot of times what the federal bureaucracies do is they're busy um, suing corporations, suing people who are violating their regulations. If I was, for example, running for office this coming election year, and I know there's finance laws, campaign finance laws, who enforces campaign finance laws? Uh, the, the federal the election. election. Federal, federal election. election. Commission. Commission. The FEC enforces campaign finance laws. If I break any of those laws, maybe I donate too much money or I receive too much money from a donor, then I can get in trouble by the FEC. The FEC can sue me. The FEC can find my campaign. So there's many ways that they can regulate. Anybody confused about what federal bureaucracies do? They make sure your food are safe. They make sure the car you drive are safe. They make sure people are following the law. All right. What two powers are given to federal bureaucracies to implement the policy, to do their job? Rulemaking and, rule -making and discretionary. discretionary authority. What is rulemaking authority? The ability of federal bureaucracies to take a policy and translate them into what? Rulemaking. Translate them into what? Rules. Rules. What do we call rules made by federal bureaucracies? Another regulations. regulations. Translate them into regulations. So, when the judicial branch hands out a decision, when Congress makes a law, when the President of the United States issues an executive order, those are translated into regulations by the federal bureaucracy. Congress wants less diabetes, we'll make uh, a rule that says you need to show your calorie content in each one of your packages. Does that make sense so far? And those regulations carry what? Report carry with law. it the force of law. Carry with it the force of law. Which a lot of people criticize that federal bureaucracies are able to make legislation uh, by themselves, which is a violation of checks and balances and separation of powers. All right. The next kind of authority is discretionary authority. It's the ability of a bureaucrat to do what? To make his own decisions, apply his what? Expertise. Applies his expertise and judgment when he's doing what? Making when he's implementing, what, does it, what do bureaucrats do? They implement Regulation. policy. They implement policy. They execute policy. So again, discretionary authority is when a bureaucrat exercises his own judgment, his own expertise. He makes his own choices when it comes to how a uh, policy is implemented or executed. Is anybody confused with, by that? When is discretionary authority usually done? When the policy or the it's law very is very vague, it's not very clear. Anybody confused by those two? Alright. Moving on, lesson two. Federal bureaucracies can be influenced by iron triangles. An agency of the federal bureaucracy can have mutually beneficial relationship with which other two components? Congressional committees and what else? Interest, Interest groups. From this relationship, each one of the components benefit from the other. What do federal bureaucracies get from Congress? They get funding, right? They control the what? Congress controls the what? The purse, the power of the purse. So they get, what do federal bureaucracies get from interest groups? Those of you that did your homework should know this. Sorry? They lobby Congress for more what? Funds. For more funds. So interest groups can lobby Congress to give federal bureaucracies more what? More funding. So that's why a federal bureaucracy might like an interest group because they're lobbying for them to get more money. What else? Those of you that did your homework. <coughs> what else can a interest group give to a federal bureaucracy? 
information. That's, that's the key one. They can give information to the federal bureaucracies and to the Congress as well. Information. So, federal bureaucracies benefit from these two components and that's going to make them more likely to make decisions that, that are according to whose wishes? Interest the interest group's wishes. And who's left out of the Iron Triangle? The people. The people. The people. Who else is left out? The president. the president is also left out of this process. Because instead of the federal bureaucracy listening to the president's wishes or executing policy the way the president wants it to be executed, they listen to Congress instead or they listen to the interest group instead because they benefit from them. Make sense? If it doesn't, make sure you let me know. All right. What are issue networks? Oh, by the way, guys, I made a mistake yesterday. I apologize on your quiz. Issue networks are also called sub-governments. So yesterday, when I told you about sub-governments, um, most of you counted issue networks wrong. So I went back to your papers, and if you put issue network, if you put network on your on your answers, I, I gave you more points. Not sure when I said they're more complex. Exactly. So, what are issue networks? They're like more complicated. Interwoven, more complicated what? Iron triangles. In reality, this interest group is actually involved in multiple iron triangles. This agency is involved in multiple iron triangles also. And that congressional committee is involved in multiple iron triangles. And that would be called an issue network. In reality, interest groups, congressional committees, and um, federal bureaucracies are involved in many different interest groups, I mean, many different iron triangles, and those are what we call um, issue networks. Anybody have any questions over that? They're just a more complicated iron triangle. And that's how most politicians want to describe what's going on right now in the United States. All right? Talked about that. Talked about that. All right. How come our Congress and our President gives a lot of leeway to these bureaucracies, gives them rulemaking authority and discretionary authority because to execute more, policy? Because they have more experience. Because they have the expertise, exactly. If there's a goal of a legislation, who's going to know best how to execute that goal? The federal bureaucracy does. Like, for example, let's say you're Congress and you have a policy. You identify a problem, your car is broken. So you make legislation that says, I need to fix the car, or the car needs to be fixed. That's the law that was passed. Is it going to be a good idea for yourself to execute that policy? Uh, no. Who do you give it to? Expert. You give it to an, an expert, which in this case would be a what? Yeah. A mechanic. So you give that legislation to a mechanic, and the mechanic would know best because he has the expertise to be able to execute that policy. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Unless you're doing this good deal. You're just mad. Tell me how Congress can limit the federal bureaucracy, can influence the federal bureaucracy. What can the Senate do? They can influence the confirmation process. If they don't like a head of agency, or they don't believe he's going to take an agency to the direction they want him to, uh, to take it, then they can refuse the confirmation. What's another one? What's the next one? Congress can do what to a legislation to limit um, bureaucratic discretion. Rewrite. Rewrite it to make it more clear, more detailed, so there's not a lot of room to do what? Discretionary. To, for discretionary authority. For discretion. Make sense? What's congressional oversight? That's Congress exercising authority over who? What's congressional oversight, guys? This is always on your AP exam. Congressional oversight is, is Congress exercising authority over the federal bureaucracy. And they can do this in two ways. First way is to do it with their budget. Tinker with their budget. If they're not doing what Congress wants them to do, if they're not executing their legislation the way Congress wants it to be executed, what can they do with an agency's budget? They can cut it. They can decrease it. They can use that power to leverage themselves against the federal bureaucracy. What's the second way we can do? Committee hearings. You can call in the what of an agency? The leaders of an agency, question them about what's going on, and pressure them to execute legislation the way you want it to be executed. If you don't feel like they're executing it the way you, that it needs to be executed, or maybe they're spending the money wrong that you're giving them, then you bring them into a congressional hearing and put pressure on them to do what Congress wants them to do. 
Again, it's like getting called to the principal's office. The goal is to correct behavior according to what Congress wants it to be. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. Sorry? Uh, accepting like, the appointments with that No, it's only the two things. Budget, hearings. Budget, hearings. All right, how, what can the president do to the federal bureaucracy? How can he limit the federal bureaucracy? All right, on your, on your test, guys, I'm no longer going to, because it's going to, it's on your homework, those of you that did your homework, it says explain how the president can influence the federal bureaucracy. So I'm no longer going to accept just the answer because you need to explain that he can appoint heads of agencies. With that power, how can he influence the federal bureaucracy? He can appoint he can appoint somebody 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 somebody. Exactly. He can appoint somebody who has the same ideology and who's going to be most likely to follow his what? His agenda. His, agenda, his goals. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. You just add that little thing at the end. Um, he can also fire people who are not uh, making decisions according to his what? According to his agenda, his ideology, or his goals. Maybe he doesn't like that an agency is executing a policy the way he doesn't want it, in disagreement to his goals, then he can fire that person. So, so you have to, what else? Um, say the president wants to fire the uh, head of the agency, or uh -huh. is there a process to that? Or like no, it's, it's just automatic. So like he has to appoint another head, so mm -hmm. do they just not have a head for a while while they're confirming? Or is it it depends, right? If Congress is not in session, what happens to the guy that he appoints? It's automatically, it's automatically in there. But if they're in session, it needs to be confirmed by the Senate. So he could fire them and time it perfectly. Sorry? So he could fire someone and time it perfectly with the recess. Exactly. Yes. Right now, a lot of people are afraid that he's going to fire the um, Secretary of the Attorney General, the Secretary of the Judiciary, or the DOJ, because of the investigations that's been happening. He wants, to, he wants to put somebody in there that's gonna get rid of the investigation against him with the Russia collusion during the election. Uh, but if he does that, then there's a political backlash because he's firing that guy for political reasons. He could do it technically, but he just doesn't want the political backlash. And he gets the for that. No. He just doesn't want the political back. Is impeachment just something if they do it? If it's something against the law, something that you're not supposed yeah. to be doing as a president. Oh, can you still pardon him? Sorry? You can't pardon himself. You can't pardon him. Can't pardon him. Can't pardon him. Can't pardon him. All right. Um, what else? The impeach. Uh, pardon myself. Uh, what else can the president do? Executive order. Executive order. What's an executive order? It's a directive. It's an order given by the president to who? Yeah. That a bureaucracy that carries what? The force of law. So if they're not doing what the president wants them to do, he can just issue an executive order and make them obey. Or he can issue an executive order that would get the agency performing his goals or, or making decisions toward his goals. How can a judicial branch? Judicial review, they can declare what unconstitutional? Regulations made by the federal bureaucracies unconstitutional. Anybody confused by that? Anybody need any help? Oh man, how long have we got out of time? Alright, so we're going to go over this really, really fast because we've been over this before. Explain how the following limits the president's influence over the federal bureaucracy. Civil service system, how does that limit the president of the United States? He can no longer do what? Appoint a lot of the positions and use politics to appoint a lot of the positions in the federal bureaucracy. And it's hard for him to do what? To fire um, somebody for political reasons, just because they're not obeying what he wants, it's hard for him to. It's, it's hard for him to fire people. He can no longer make a lot of the appointments that he used to make using politics, using connections, and stuff like that. How does discretionary authority limit the president of the United States? Because instead of executing policy of a federal agency executing policy according to the wishes of the president, what do they do? They apply their own judgment, they apply their own expertise when it comes to policy implementation. So it's like their own signing statement. Kind of. So instead of going along with the president's goals, right, a bureaucrat sometimes has power, discretionary power, to implement uh, a policy the way they would want it to be implemented instead of the way the president wants it to be implemented. Can you explain that? All right, so discretionary authority limits the President of the United States' power because instead of 
implementing policy according to the president's goals, they can exercise their own judgment, they can exercise their own expertise when implementing that policy. They don't have to, but there's a risk to that, right? If I was the EPA and there's a signing statement made by the president that this is how I want it to be executed, right? If I don't execute it the way that the president wants me to execute it, what can happen to the EPA? The head might get fired. <laughs> yes. All right. How do iron triangles limit the president's? Um, you need to explain. So give me a brief description of iron triangle. An iron triangle is a mutually beneficial relationship between what? Uh, uh, Congress and the federal bureaucracy. And then answer the question. How do you answer the question? Uh, because they're no longer just going by what the president wants. Instead of making decisions or implementing policy the way the president wants it to be implemented, they're serving who? The interest, the interest groups or they're serving Congress because they benefit from those two. Anybody have any questions? All right, next one. Why does Congress allow the federal bureaucracy? We already covered this. Why do they give them a lot of discretionary and rulemaking authority? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they have the expertise. They're gonna know best how a legislation, how a policy should be executed to reach the goal. Usually they know best. All right, three, explain how iron triangles limit the influence of the public on their government. Same thing, only change the president to what? To the public, right? Iron triangles are mutually beneficial relationships between blah, blah, blah. Instead of serving the people's will, they serve the interests of interest groups and the interests of con congressional committees instead. Anybody have any questions on that? Moving on. Four, describe the ways each of the following can limit the president influence on the federal bureaucracy. I told you what you need to have for the appointment and firing, right? Don't just say he can appoint or he can fire. Tell me how that influences the federal bureaucracy. Everyone good by that? Okay. Congress, how can Congress do it? Many different ways. Budget, rewrite, information, what else? Rewrite, what else? Congressional oversight, make sure you don't just tell me congressional oversight. Explain what congressional oversight is and how it can influence um, Congress. They can take care with their budget to force them to, um, do congress to um, obey congressional wishes. They can bring them into uh, congressional hearings to pressure them to do what Congress wants them to do, to implement policy the way Congress wants it to be implemented. Federal courts, everybody good with that? Judicial review, right? Anybody have any questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. the president one more time. The president of the United States has the ability to appoint the heads of agency. He can choose people that are going to be more likely to follow his goals. Right, so that they will execute policy according to his goals. Yes. Uh, the limit the government, limit the president on the civil service. How does the civil service limit? Right. Right. Okay. So the civil service system um, limits the president because it doesn't allow him to. to no, he's no longer allowed to hire most of the positions, bureaucratic kind of positions, and he can't fire people just for political reasons, except for the agency heads. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Let's check your. Go back to your groups, please. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay.